All right. Thank you uh, for coming back uh, for the third section. And we're going to talk about macromolecules and really the fun stuff, the, the key stuff behind the basics of biochemistry and the like that drives life is fascinating. And I want to share some of that as we go along here. So this is section 1.3 on structures of life. And there'll be some additional uh, information. Uh, it's optional if you, you want to look in and uh, just kind of pursue it a little bit on your own. Uh, th there won't be any real assignments uh, pertaining directly. But you can make paper molecules and fold them and the like. And I'll give you a website for that. And so you can kind of see hands-on how they look. Now, I usually bring in... Uh, 3d models that I printed that uh, represent some of these macromolecules and, and you don't have advantage of that But I'll give you the website that I got uh, The information and the actual models to print from PDB's website the protein data bank and All of their stuff allows you to see these proteins in 3d and you can rotate them. It's all free and uh, supports about 99% of the browsers that are out there so I recommend that at least if you're interested and curious, it's there for you. So we're going to talk about uh, main uh, families of uh, biochemical types of things. And, and these are important to, to be aware of because these characteristics are what uh, ultimately become the characteristics of life. And of course, bacteria are really close uh, in terms of size and the like. And uh, the biochemistry that uh, knowing about that is really important. We're going to talk about cell components and uh, from each of the families of biochemicals that we uh, think are important. We're going to talk about what at primary, secondary, and tertiary quaternary levels of protein uh, structure. Now, one of the things that a lot of students will tell you that I'm big on structure and function because if you know the structure and the function, then you see how it plays its role in life. And it's, it's so fascinating to see these things uh, come out. And then... Uh, we're going to talk about what a nucleotide is and the components of those. So there's terminology is really important. There's nucleotides, there's nucleosides, uh, and it, it talks about what is contained in those three components. And so the tide part, the nucleotide, has three components. A nucleoside has two, and, and therefore we'll, we'll talk about uh, just the nucleotide part. Name the nitrogen bases of the DNA and RNA, which uh, you should already know, but it's good to review. And three components of ATP and the characteristics that are common to all cells. And these are just the basics. Uh, so, superstructures of life. Macromolecules, of course, are large, but they're built of building blocks of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Monomers uh, are subunits of macromolecules, so it could be composed of a single one, mono, uh, repeating one, or a repeating mixture or a polymer of uh, various chain lengths of monomers, so the subunits. And what's interesting, I'll just go ahead and abstract out a little bit, how these things are linked and the like are fundamentally very easily done. It's usually done through a hydrolysis or dehydration type of reaction where you're taking out or adding to water molecules. And so it, the, the basis of how these things are linked are universal. However, it's linking these together in a certain configuration and having the genetics behind that organizes all of that and how that comes to being. Now that's really, really interesting. And you think about the bacteria and, and their ability to, to configure themselves or be configured however you want to look at uh, it is quite quite amazing to me. It's just one of those things. So this is a really important table. Uh, please spend a little bit of time looking at this because this is in a nutshell everything that sort of comprises life uh, at, at the basic units. Aminosaccharides Again, uh, there's a, uh, a document in the resource area. It's a Latin terms. And a lot of these words that we talk about are derived from Latin or Greek. Mono meaning one. Sacker 
is a Greek word. It, it's a sweet tasting, a sweet uh, sort of thing. So it's one sugar, and then the ides means that they're uh, linked together. Glucose, fructose are examples of three to seven carbon sugars. So glucose is uh, seven carbon uh, type of sugar, and um, uh, six carbon, excuse me, fructose, five carbon. Sugar is involved in metabolic reactions, building blocks of disaccharides and polysaccharides. Disaccharides are two monosaccharides linked together uh, through a dehydration reaction uh, to form, let's say, maltose or malt sugar or sucrose that you use at the dinner table uh, that uh, has two sugars uh, together com uh, composed. Now, maltose is two glucose. And so the names are the individual types of sugars, the monosaccharides linked together, and then they have uh, names. Uh, lactose is milk sugar, and that's composed of glucose and galactose, and then the table sugar I mentioned is composed of glucose and fructose. And uh, so we'll look at some of the basic structures. Polysaccharides are chains of monosaccharides, uh, one or single sugars, a starch, cellulose glycogen and what's interesting about these and I've already pointed out is how these are linked now we can break down starch and glycogen and that sort of thing cellulose we can't break down directly and so if you ever wonder why cows are sitting there on the side of the road and behind the fence on the farmers lot chewing its cud and uh, sort of regurgitating and chewing and uh, that sort of thing and what it's doing is uh, in its gut, its ruminant type gut that has compartments, bacteria are actually actively growing, breaking down the cellulose into the individual sugars then are incorporated into the animal's uh, uh, nutrition. And of course, um, then it's incorporated into its being, its, its tissues and the like. And it's that process uh, of cellulose that we can't break down uh, directly but indirectly through uh, the uh, animals and the products and things like that uh, we get the benefit of it and so it, it's really really interesting so cell walls food storage and various things are made up of these uh, chains these polysaccharides and the cell walls are a way bacteria kind of defend themselves from the, the, the world okay lipids fats Okay, when it, you have lipodemia and those sorts of conditions, it, it's how many uh, uh, fats that you have in your blood and that sort of thing. Triglycerides or fatty acids plus glycerol. And so, uh, oddly enough, how many fatty acids and glycerol? Glycerol kind of holds three, tri, together, fats and oils. And they're the major components of cell membranes and storage. And uh, we have... Uh, phospholipids are fatty acids plus glycerol and phosphate. So phospho, of course, there is the phosphate, and then you have the fat or the lipid uh, held together with glycerol. And uh, you can see the membrane components. Waxes are fatty acids and alcohols. And so it's how, again, they're arranged. And with the OH, you see, uh, uh, and COH uh, groups on there, so you have that sort of ending structure on there as the alcohol. And mycolic acid is something that we uh, use the uh, acid fast stain for, for tuberculosis and things like that. And so it's a cell wall of mycobacteria. And we'll talk about those. Steroids are ring structures, cholesterol, ergosol, and those sorts of things are steroids. In membranes, are eukaryotes and some bacteria. And steroids, uh, like cholesterol and, and the like, act as stiffeners, I guess you could say, for membranes. And uh, components uh, that are on membranes serve as certain functions. And these functions are kind of brought together as rafts. So these protein interact together sort of on this little raft that floats. It, it may be uh, floating with a cholesterol type of uh, basis. And it brings together these functional type proteins that do things, you know, transport things across membranes or act as sensors and all sorts of interesting things. And again, I just want you to appreciate the cleverness or the, the utility and the simplicity and elegance of these sorts of things that can 
confer certain functions and it's it's quite amazing nucleic acids nucleotides pentose sugar plus phosphate plus a nitrogen base there's your nucleotide and so the, the pentose sugar phosphate and the nitrogen base together linked in a in a particular configuration has a function so the nitrogen bases of purines which are adenine and guanine and pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine and uracil uh, RNA has the uracil part that replaces uh, the thymine now I have a little trick to remember the structures and you don't have to worry about drawing them but recognizing them purines is a simple word it's smaller than pyrimidines which is more complex well it's sort of reverse so pyrimidines have the simple structure so it's just a cyclic ring on its own purines or more complicated structure it has a, a ring plus an added uh round uh, like one uh, two three additional four carbons that come off in uh, the the main ring so uh, pyrimidines are the simple ones purines are the more complex and you can see the structures but i use mnemonics or tricks like that to try to remember these things and uh, nurses are famous for their little ditties uh, to memorize certain things i'm not big in the memorization but when you've got lots of certain terms to put together for a particular uh, thing having a little ditty where you take the first letter of each of the words and that sort of thing and you can form a new word out of that is a memory uh, trick uh, that's a good thing to do and a lot of a lot of folks do that uh, DNA contains deoxyribo uh, sugar and thymine and not uracil so deoxyribonucleic acid uh, so the deoxy part uh, means something and so uh, uh, think about what the deoxy would mean versus a uh, just having ribonucleic acid instead and it contains ribo sugar and uracil not thymine so RNA is uracil containing it which we know it's an RNA and DNA of course uh, it does not contain the uracil part but uh, anyhow it's, it's clear and it's all summarized and the uh, RNA molecules uh, at least some of them that we talk about is messenger RNA transfer RNA which is the decoder ring uh, between the sugar system and proteins and small RNAs and genetic materials of viruses which viruses could be RNA or DNA never both and um, and then of course it's it's all about facilitating the genetic uh, characteristics from that so this is an important chart it's it's one of those that kind of just summarizes and I love summar summaries like this now carbohydrates have a characteristic I love the chemists because uh, they really work hard on having a universal like uh, uh, code or the way we use the words and if you see a word that ends with OSE at the end then you know it's going to be uh, some sort of sugar and of course that again um, transforms into a carbohydrate so hexose hex being six pentose uh, OSE is sugar pent means five uh, glucose the most common and universal important uh, hexose and glucose uh, there's a long history I won't go into it. glucose but everyone knows glucose fructose from fruits uh, named for fruit xylose from the Greek word wood and xylose is uh, the Greek uh, language is, is as you know is a little bit different it uses a, a, a different um, symbol for its alphabet and the Greeks were a very um, touchy-feely type in terms of earth, wind, fire, you know, those sorts of things. And everything had a, a kind of a, uh, a, a concise meaning in some ways, but uh, sort of a global or not so uh, pin it down type feeling. And so the, the Greek uh, words tend to have more than one uh, meaning, but it's okay. Uh, we want to try to utilize as best we can as um, medical personnel to, to help us remember and know these things. And that's the systematic learning part. Lactose is a component of milk. You know, lactose uh, intolerant and those sorts of things is that particular sugar. 
Maltose is malt sugar. If you ever had a malted milkshake and that sort of thing. Sucrose is table sugar or cane sugar is uh, the terminology. So, OSE. Cellulose is cell wall plants now. Cellulose is that type that has a unique kind of bonding that we can't break down. And cell wall plants and many algae. The cellulose, so you know at least it has a sugar, OSE at the end is how it's linked. And uh, the linkages are, the, of course, the way things are they're linked together. And you can kind of think of the cellulose, and, and this is probably not really good terminology, but I just want you to think of it. Cellulose is having an upside down link where uh, sugars that are linked with, that are upright, uh, in other words, they all repeat uh, without having to alternate or flip it. Uh, are ones that we can break down. The ones that are flipped, like cellulose, we can't break down. Agar, now some say agar. Um, I was in uh, many labs, and everybody I know pronounce, pronunciates it as agar. So, anyhow, um, I guess there's lots of uh, wind and wind and all sorts of things like that, but um, important component of the culture media, and we're going to uh, utilize uh, auger. Now they used to use potatoes as a medium to grow bacteria. Uh, auger turned out to be a really nice uh, one. It's it's made from a particular type of seaweed and we see something similar uh, to that uh, component in seaweed uh, that's add, uh, it's used as a thickener in ice creams and things like that and uh, it, it's not so good for your liver and yet it's in there but uh, anyhow, unless I digress, I don't want to do that. Uh, a chitin, or chitin, however, the two can be soft C or hard C. Uh, a chitin is a cell wall found in fungi, not fungi, but fungi. Um, a peptidoglycan is a component of bacterial cell walls. And we're going to talk a lot about peptidoglycan. So we know it's a sugar of some kind that's linked or modified with this, this little peptid. Uh, one of the things you can think about is proteins are also referred to as peptides. So now you can kind of think about uh, what this component might be. Component of bacterial cell walls. Lipo, fat, polysaccharide. So it's fat and sugars linked together. And uh, a component of gram-negative cell walls. And so they have LPS is another way of saying uh, the L for lipo, poly is the P, and S is the saccharide, LPS. Toxic shock syndrome, things like that, uh, kind of responsible for this molecule. Glycocalyx, this is kind of, uh, sugar covering is technically sort of the way to look at that word. Uh, anywhere you see a vowel, like the O, it's sort of like a connecting vowel in, in Latin and that sort of thing. In English, kind of borrows a lot of that, but glyco, uh, glyc is sugar, calyx is covering, so it's a protective outer layer or role in the attachment of cells to, to other cells and surfaces. So we have to have a component that has a certain uh, electrical characteristic and binding characteristic allow these organisms to stick. And we're going to talk about uh, forming biofilms and things like that. You can write down the word biofilm. We're going to talk a lot about biofilms. And anyone that's going in uh, for dental uh, types of things, uh, biofilms should be held close and near because biofilms are really the part of the tooth decay, the crucial forming um, aspect of these organisms because they, they facilitate other bacteria to bind and then it's synergistic. Individually, they're not as, as, they can't do as much, but together they can do a whole lot. And we'll talk more about that. Isn't bacteria interesting? I mean, isn't it just it's amazing? So here's some drawings of these, uh, what I was talking about, linking together these monosaccharides to form polysaccharides and disaccharides and, and those sorts of things. And, and so it's, we see these uh, types of sugars and they're upright. You can see they're the same, duplicated with this uh, link here. And we see these links uh, here as well in these polysaccharides and uh, when I say flipped or when I talk about cellulose you can take this molecule and just flip it and so you'd have the link uh, doing a kind of an interesting uh, type of thing and uh, so 
uh, we'll talk about uh, that detail but it's it's a, just a subtle way for you to recognize these sorts of things triglycerides important storage of lipids composed of a single molecule of glycerol bound to three fatty acids hence the name triglycerides fatty acids can be saturated or unsaturated and what they're referring to here is the amount of hydrogens to satisfy the octet rule in other words each uh, element has uh, up to eight uh, uh, and we're talking about the outer shell in terms of how many uh, it wants to be stable and how many electrons are flying around and it really wants to have all of those electrons uh, satisfied to fill uh, with some sort of bonding and uh, hydrogens and if there's some that uh, don't have those electrons which make up each of the elements and so what it wants to try to do is to become more stable and so what happens is the hydrogen will associate and share and so it it uh, sharing is is not the best as having but it's closer and it's more stable as a result so if we have lots of hydrogens saturating all of those particular open seats let's say to satisfy the octet rule uh, then we say it's saturated if the hydrogens are not filling all of the seats we refer to that as unsaturated and what happens is the fatty acid uh, because not having all of those hydrogens will kink it will bend outward and that has an implication so uh, we'll look at that at some point you already probably know that stored in long-term concentrated forms as droplets or globules and we know that the, those uh, areas that are that store that in eukaryotes and that sort of thing they use the the tap later if, if times get tough and that sort of thing um, they yield twice as much energy per gram than other storage molecules of carbohydrates well it has twice as much of those carbon chains and when we talk about energy what we're talking about is chemical bond energy uh, i just want to clarify so it, they throw that term around a lot and it's the chemical bond energy when you break a bond it releases a packetized little force of energy and that uh, puts a change in the structure of something it forces the structure to change its shape and so that's the energy that uh, drives all of life and chemical bond energy so really quick without even thinking which of the two of those fatty acids there you think is unsaturated well obviously you can see the hydrogens filling all the available carbon in the, the first one the palmitic acid one and of course that's saturated with all those hydrogens now we see linoleic acid with several of the double bonds in them that means that they you know i could resolve those double bonds by adding hydrogens with hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated which god help you if you ever try to eat those sorts of things uh, it's not good for you but anyhow uh see we have those kinks and so that's the difference between butter staying solid at room temperature in the saturated and the unsaturated tends not to lay as flat and it will form an oil and so you can see the kind of the structural function now looking at what holds triglycerides together look at the glycerol and then you have those hydroxyl groups those oh groups and then you see the fatty acids and you take away a water and now you form the triglyceride all held together with that one glycerol molecule and so you see that chain and that's what uh, drives those uh, fatty acids you see uh, below and so i hope this this one graphic really kind of pulls together the thinking and uh, the the idea of the octet rule uh, is important too certain characteristics of membranes and we're going to see water liking and water hating so we have hydrophilic which loves water it uh, has a negative charge and this is important because like dissolves like or like likes to be around things that have like charge and so hydrophilic areas water loving likes to be kind of together with water loving areas usually facing water of course hydrophobic or water fearing and they tend to move away and they love to be around other phobics they're afraid of water and they like to hang out together and so the tails 
don't really have a charge. It's sort of like gasoline and water and they don't mix. Well, the gasoline would be sort of hydrophobic, right? It's water fearing where the water kind of sits on top. So when exposed to an aqueous solution, charge heads are attracted to the water because water is bipolar. If you look at H2O, uh, and we can talk about uh, electronegativity and all sorts of things, but when the two uh, H2O, um, we have the two hydrogens kind of associating with the, the oxygen because the electronegativity is different, if you recall that term, which is a measured phenomenon that Linus Pauling did way back when. But what they found was the size of these atoms were a little bit different and they associate and there's always bond angles when they associate and bond together and it leaves a little bald spot at the top of that oxygen and the hydrogens kind of coalesce at the bottom so that you get this bipolar molecule so you have sort of a positive charge at one end and a negative charge at the other because the, the hydrogens kind of fill at one end because of the electronegativity difference, the size difference and then the oxygen is a much bigger molecule and it's uh, a more electronegative and it tends to be exposed at the top because there's no hydrogens up there so it forms that bipolar part and so charged heads there are attracted to the water face now water has both characteristics bipolar nonpolar tails are repelled from water because well it, it the, the tails are just carbon and they uh, or the carbon-hydrogen type of thing, long chains, and they tend not to like water because, hey, you know, there's nothing to bond to. It doesn't really, it's kind of charge neutral. So anyhow, naturally assumes a single or double layer or bilayer. Now, that's what makes up the membranes, the fact that we have the polar heads, I mean, the polar tails, um, no, the, the charge heads, the polar part, uh, coalesce on the outside, and then the tails will kind of meet together. And we can form a, a, a micelle, which is sort of like a big circle, a water droplet, uh, naturally, spontaneously. Or it'll form two layers. We have the uh, water loving on both sides, and in between are the tails kind of inserted together in that uh, nonpolar area in between. That makes up membranes, this universal membrane all of life has. And it's really quite interesting. So I hope that makes sense to you. So here is the phospholipid, there's the phosphate group and then the lipid group and you can see the long chains and what makes one of them kink of course is that double bond there so you can have a mixture of these and here is over here is the big key is that phospholipid bilayer, we have a bilayer, this is hydrophobic in the middle and you notice that there's an aspersion of maybe uh, some proteins that may just go on one side or the other or ones that transfer all the way across and those allow things to be uh, either uh, transported across or serves as a recognition. We see sugars hanging off a protein and something binds to it may change that shape. And then we see that change shape on the other side. And so uh, that's the mind cell right there I was talking about. And they form this spontaneously, but they also will form this phospholipid bilayer for the water. Uh, loving on both sides and the water uh, fearing in the middle and so you'll see uh, that very very often membranes are fluid even though this is static it's not moving because it's a drawing but I want you to think of it as floating it's sort of like buoys and it's it's moving and it's dynamic and it's constantly flowing and uh, that makes it really really interesting and these float in there and I was mentioning the cholesterol it, it, you know it stiffens the membrane so it doesn't become so f so fluid it actually if they have too much cholesterol it makes it kind of brittle and can break apart but the the idea behind it is sometimes the the cholesterol helps these proteins to kind of uh, group up together and travel around the membranes as a single uh, functional unit and I will talk more about that so the carbohydrates uh, and the phospholipids are there but the steroids uh, complex ring compounds found in cell membranes and animal hormones so the sex hormones and various things like that cholesterol reinforces the cell membrane like I was mentioning in animal cells and cell wall deficient bacteria 
and so cholesterol is um, is necessary. We know it's a bad thing if you have too much of the wrong ones and that sort of thing. But uh, it, the way I look at it is cholesterol is really uh, an important characteristic that kind of adds to the functionality of membranes. So if you can remember that part of it, it's pretty cool. And then, of course, cell wall deficient bacteria plays a role. Waxes, like earwax, form long chain alcohol types of these uh, esters. Esters is just is a fancy word for bound together uh, alcohols and these uh, saturated fatty acids. Waterproofing in fur, feathers, fruits, leaves, and human skin, insects, exoskeletons, and the various things. And waxes, of course, you know, very important. Everyone knows what a wax is. Found in the cell wall, bacteria that cause tuberculosis and leprosy, contributing to their pathogenicity. So uh, we have uh, the, the, the causative agents for both of these have characteristics, which we'll talk about uh, that are important and uh, these are really interesting uh, pathogens that we study. They have characteristics that allow them to grow in your tissues. The membranes with its bilayers of lipids, now what they're trying to describe here is that these uh, proteins are kind of drawn as a solid, you can see that, but really what you're looking at is the influence of all the electron sort of cloud that they make. Now we could draw the structure and uh, as they sh they've got it here and you can see this uh, kind of fancy cholesterol kind of molecule but we actually represent it as the cloud of all the electrons and everything kind of uh, it's an area of probability and the computers and the way scientists look at it is they draw it as a solid and it, it's not truly a solid well if you look in the physics nothing really is a solid but I don't want to get into that uh, but we represent it as such and so I just want to make that point that a lot of times I print models that represent this now I could print a model that has this certain uh, look to it but they break easy and that sort of thing uh, and really it's all about the area of influence these chemical structures have and that's why we draw it the way we do and so this protein would be the same sort of thing it would be a series of amino acids and it's not truly solid like that. It would be a chain of, of amino acids that we call a protein. And uh, we kind of draw that sort of area of influence around it. And that's a representation. So I just want to make that point. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you already know that. But um, I, I want to state the obvious. It's important that we do that. Proteins predominate uh, organic molecules and cells. Uh, composed of 20 different amino acids. So all of life all the things that we see have 20 keys on the keyboard so all the con concertos and all the music that's played on the keys of a keyboard of a uh, piano which i forget is 104 40 keys or something like that and all of the concertos are made with from those keys well all of life is composed of 20 amino acids or 20 keys and but it's the arrangement of these that makes life unique and interesting and so it's how they're arranged and uh, sequenced. So peptide is a molecule composed of short chains of amino acids. A polypeptide usually has 20, more than 20 amino acids, often a smaller subunit of a protein. A protein usually contains a minimum of 50 amino acids. And so that's where the nomenclature kind of takes in if it's small, little short peptide. And there's a lot of sort of bioactive peptides that bacteria produce which are really important in the gut, by the way. We're going to talk about that. Polypeptides, you know, those also important. Various things are used for communication or uh, all sorts of activities. And proteins, of course, can be structural, could be all sorts of things. And we'll talk about that. 50 amino acids or so, or much more. Uh, heme is, of course, uh, a component of our blood that holds an iron molecule that allows us to transport oxygen and it's com composed of subunits you see and so we can build proteins with uh, groups of proteins and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that so the primary structure is the sequence of those amino acids that's the type number and order but i just say it's a sequence of those amino acids 
And secondary structure arises when various functional groups interact by forming hydrogen bonds. So we have alpha helix, beta pleated sheet, and it's sort of the transitional uh, state that it formed. It doesn't really say that, but it's uh, as it's being made and it starts to assume it's either spherical, uh, you know, a helical type thing or sort of like stairs, a pleated sheet, and then eventually matures into um, a more uh, robust structure. But beta, alpha helix, and random coils we sort of see. Now there's the primary structure. You can see the amino acid sequence. And we, you know, the various 20 glycine, asparagine, tryptophan, uh, gl glycine, histamine, phenylalanine, lysine. I just see some of the names of various uh, amino acids there in the links. And so you see that. The tertiary structure, now we're getting into the actual, the, when the rubber hits the road, the real functional part, it, tertiary structure, created by additional bonds and functional groups. So as the protein starts to fold it interacts with charges amongst itself so when there's a negative area and a positive area they kind of are attracted and it'll fold in a certain way and that is the functional group now what dictates the fold is the sequence and the charge and its shape but that's all pre-programmed because the structure and function is the shape and the shape plays a big role in addition to the charge in what it does and with all the computer hardware and software programs we have, we really still can't predict uh, once a protein's made what it does. We have to observe it and see that sort of thing. We're not there totally yet, but uh, we have that tertiary structure of the three. So uh, I hope you see that. Now the quaternary structure is like the heme group I was talking about. It's the interaction of subunits of tertiary structures. And so you have more than one peptide forming a large multi-unit type protein. That's a quaternary structure. So it's more complex. So now you can see with just 20 amino acids, we can start to do some really interesting things by bringing totally different proteins together and they bond. So, um, and the incredible knowledge and, and programming that goes behind that with the DNA sequences uh, is really key and, and it's uh, keeping the function and that sort of thing. So, amino acids containing cysteine form disulfide bonds. And those are really strong bonds. And I'll equate that, if you ever go into a mall and you see this, and smell this really sicky sulfur smell, the mercaptic smell, it's not good. Somebody's getting their hair permed, right? Well, what you're doing is introducing sulfur containing compounds that forms with the the hair that causes that disulfide bond and it it makes the hair kind of stay in that shape whatever it is that the beautician wants or you want or whatever and you pay money for it and eventually over time it uh, gets washed out and then you got to go back and pay some more money to do it again but amino acids have known about this for a long time and so when uh, we look at, let's say, antibody structures, what holds some of the key features of that antibody structure, we'll talk about those, don't worry about it now, but it has sulfur. And so anytime you look at a molecule and you see sulfur bridges or sulfur bonds, they're strong. And that's kind of the key point I, I wanted to make. Structure and function. So there's ter the tertiary structure is just a protein that's kind of folded in a certain way it's not random uh it folds in a certain way now some think that alzheimer's is a result of uh un a misfolded proteins now uh, no one really knows there's a lot of theories going around as to what's going on but uh there is some sort of characteristic of misfolded proteins and prions and all sorts of stuff we'll talk about uh, quaternary structures you can see the different colors of those subunit proteins they're different amino acid sequences so they're different proteins and they come together because of their shape and charge and they form a new functional product together as a quaternary structure and that is really what's amazing about uh, the simplicity of the 20 amino acids now fulminating into this more complex quaternary structure just blows my mind and it's all part of life and it's off it goes 
So more protein structure and diversity. Each protein develops a unique shape. I would highlight, underline, circle, memorize, uh, uh, I don't know, home and uh, get in a, uh, oh, never mind. And its surface displays a distinct pattern of pockets and bulges. And so it's a shape and charges and, and the like that are really, really key. Speaking of key, it's sort of like a key in a lock in, in a certain way that it fits, the key fits that lock. And because of that, now you can do something like open the lock. Proteins can only interact with molecules that fit its particular surface features like a lock and key. And so it's not only surface features, but charge as well. Enzymes are catalysts. They're not consumed in the reaction. They're catalysts that they help facilitate. What they do is they put pressure on certain bonds or make certain bonds by bringing two uh, separate uh, chemical structures together hoping that it reduces the amount of energy it takes to, to either form a bond or to break a bond. If you put stress on a bond, it's going to be easier to break it. So there you go. And that's a catalyst and for a chemical reaction. Antibodies, which I just mentioned, are glycoproteins, sugar proteins with specific regions of attachment for bacteria, viruses, and other uh, uh, microorganisms. So at the end of, one end of it, it has a a unique key that fits whatever characteristic of viruses, bacteria, whatever, and our immune system attaches to it to clear it, to get rid of it, to tag it, to bag it, whatever you want to say. And the other end of that molecule will bind certain types of cells, like mast cells, that cause uh, triggers histamine release of if the antigens bind the the ends of the, the other ends of those antibodies. We'll talk about that in chapter 13, 14 or so. Native state is the function of three-dimensional form of a protein. It's its normal way it folds. Denatured, we disrupt it. If you heat like an egg, you know that gooey gloppy yellow and the gooey gloppy around it, and you heat it, it changes, uh, it turns from clear to, to whitish material. Well, you just denature that protein. We have shaken it so violently that the, the integrity of that particular peptide uh, has been broken and you can't reverse it and there you go heat acid alcohols and disinfectants and we we want to know that because if we want to kill bacteria in various or clean surfaces we want to disrupt those sorts of things and kill them and that's why we want to study these things the dna contains specific coded sequence it's a program uh, and specific instructions for its heredity and in addition to that it uh we can make RNA for regulation, and it's, it's just amazing what we can do. So RNA molecules are responsible for carrying out DNA's instructions and translating the DNA program. So uh, we form a messenger RNA and translating with a transfer RNA, and then we form with a ribosome. We get proteins made based on that transcript and the anticodon um, coming together with that ribosome, and we just have magic going on there and uh, we'll talk about that. So the double helix formed by two very long uh, anti-parallel strands, by the way, they're, we, they're, they go by five prime and three prime ends of the DNA. So all DNA has a five prime end and a three prime end. And these double helix strands are anti-parallel. So the three prime end matches with a five prime end. And so they're anti-parallel. So uh, they kind of range like that. Um, we'll talk more about it later, but I wanted to point that out because it's sometimes a subtle concept that tends to elude us at times. Pairing of the nitrogen bases occurs according to a predictable pattern. And the Shargoff rule, that Dr. Shargoff found this, that adenine always pairs with thymine, so A's and T's, and G's and C's. Why this is important? Well, you know, there's certain examples that I can give, and one that a lot of students remember, that... Uh, A's and T's have two hydrogen bonds and G's and C's have three and it's very subtle what how these pair and how they arrange let me show you so we have you can see now the G's and C's you can see the number of hydrogen bondings that go on here's the C and G they have three and A's and T's have two and what's the implication of that well this is so important uh, of a structural feature that it uh, caused a design change um, now I'm going to just talk 
generically between men and women and we know the plumbing is different between men and women for lots of reasons but one of the characteristics or design considerations is uh, where sperms made in the male has to um, be cooled a little bit more because if you have higher heat these bonds having only two tend to break apart more so it follows if you have a lot of a's and t's we got a we got a temperature consideration that uh, we can't handle uh, 98.6 we got to cool it down just a few degrees or we'll start losing a lot of these a's and t's um, bonding together believe it or not it's a very subtle design consideration to make and so we had to have all this weird plumbing to uh, to ad adjust for that thermal characteristics of just the basic DNA. I don't know if you ever mentioned that. I had a physiological biochemistry course that taught me that. And it, it stuck with me forever. It's just like, wow, there, there is a reason uh, or an implication of these things. And we show, show it uh, showing up. So if... Uh, Again, in the male, uh, it seems to be the Y chromosome tends to be uh, uh, a little bit more heat sensitive because it's AT rich than an X chromosome. And so if uh, you like to use hot tubs or tight clothing and that sort of thing, we tend to favor having uh, more girls because, well, the, the Y chromosome is, is less stable and we don't see it as much. So you won't have sperm cells survive that have that uh, Y chromosome. So there you go. It's important why we uh, make these distinctions because it helps our understanding of what's going on in nature because of its chemical uh, back uh, makeup. So uh, RNA organizes a protein synthesis and again this should be review. The messenger RNA is sort of the transcript a copy or whatever of let's say the recipe and then the transfer RNA with uh, help of the ribosome the transfer RNA finds the uh, right position and uh, the transfer RNA inside that ribosome and if it matches with the codon and anticodon then it sort of triggers the ribosome to say okay the transfer RNA a charge transfer RNA will have an amino acid attached to it and oddly enough only to a unique sequence uh, on its codon and or anti-codon in case for the transfer RNA and it meets the codon on the messenger RNA and if uh, it, it, it uh, matches up within the parameters of that ribosome the magic happens with the 20 amino acids and the charged transfer RNAs um, so there you go the transfer RNA or the uh, the decoder ring I guess of the whole system is the transfer RNA so we get the right sequence of messenger that translates to the right amino acid being placed for protein so there you go the ribosomal RNA is a major component of the ribosome so they the ribosomal RNA help hold the transfer RNA and uh, 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 and other aspects of making the ribosome work the fourth type of RNA acts to regulate the genes and gene expression and so these are interference RNAs and all sorts of other things and we're finding out more and more how RNA actually rules the day and our understanding of DNA is still important but RNA plays a much bigger role than we ever thought so all that junk DNA they taught me wasn't really junk DNA it uh, serves for a lot of sources for the RNA so adenine triphosphate ATP, the energy molecule of life, is also the same ATP that we see in DNA. Uh, but for some reason, ATP became the master card of, of cells. It's accepted in more places than anything else. Uh, now we have GTP and some of the other things that can serve for energy or regulators and uh, communicators. But ATP has a unique role of... Uh, providing a chemical bond energy by cleaving off that phosphate group and we get 32 kilocalories per mole uh, of energy a burst of energy that can change the shape of a protein molecule with that energy energizing throughout so that chemical bond energy is the driver and that is energy that is really really important uh, to drive all of life and so there's that magic molecule 
and you see the adenosine diphosphate and triphosphate. Another unique aspect of this molecule, of course, is that we can take ADP and add a phosphate group to it and make ATP. And then we can break it down, that chemical bond, and release that energy. And then it serves its function to do something. And then we can build it right back. So it's rechargeable. So it's like a credit card from that standpoint that uh, when you run it out, then you can go back and just charge it. Wouldn't that be nice um, to have to do that without going to the bank? Uh, fundamental characteristics of cells. Uh, we have the bacteria and protozoa, which are single cells. Animals and plants are trillions of cells. Now keep in mind, all of the chemistry that we talked about are actually being played now within these organisms. The characteristics, the spherical, polygonal, cuboidal, centrical uh, uh, type, contain protoplasm uh, encased in the cell. All of this is due to the biochemistry that we just talked about, and all these things take on its form of life. Chromosomes containing DNA, ribosomes for protein synthesis, and exceedingly complex in function. So all of these are fulminating from the basics of the biochemistry that we've talked about. As simple as it may be in the subunits, come together and, and uh, make the most extraordinary uh, thing called life. It's amazing. So eukaryotic cells versus uh, bacteria in archaea cells. Now I'm going to say again just to review, but archaea cells, we don't really worry about it in this class because they're not really medically important. So I, I'm biased. <laughs> I'm more interested, and you will be too because that's your business in, in, uh, in the healthcare profession, is that we worry about people being sick. So there, there are eukaryotic type cells that cause disease and bacteria, of course. But archaea, no, because either I don't know too many patients that are, you know, walking around 200 degrees or something like that, or uh, a block of ice or something. So we, we're not worried too much about that. But archaea are the older ones, and you, know, you can know that. But eukaryote cells, animals, plants, fungi, protozoa, contain organelles that are encapsulated or encased. They have cubicles that are encased by membranes, and they perform specific functions. Of course, you know, we have the Golgi apparatus, we have the... The, the nucleus and all those sorts of things. Now, uh, I'll post a, a business analogy if you want to look at it for a cell just to review. Um, I like uh, providing that for my Bio 110 students because it, it kind of relates everyday things to the organization of a eukaryotic cell. And uh, students like it, but hey, if you want it, uh, I'll make it available to you. Um, I'll put that in the resource area. The bacteria and archaea, well, the bacteria and archaea don't have a true nucleus, although, as I mentioned, has a big circular piece, double-stranded DNA. Uh, it's sort of like a bathtub. You think of a bacteria as a bathtub, with everything kind of floating in it. So you have a you, you know, little rubber ducky, and you've got your uh, soap, and you've got various other things floating in there, and um, uh, all those are kind of milieu together. And so they don't have a component, per se, that stores just DNA or anything that kind of floats all together. Uh, but it does have complex, fine structures. Don't think these are slouches and they're simple. They're really not. They're lean, mean fighting machines. And they can engage in a lot of activities that eukaryotic cells can do. But think of it as, as a really fancy car with a huge overhead, costs a lot of money, where the bacteria, hmm, I don't need all that fanciness. I just, whatever is basics, it gets the job done. I'm lean, I'm mean, and I'm a fighting machine. And there you go is the difference between eukaryotes and bacteria. And uh, I hope that helps. So we are done with this section. The next one, um, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not really big on uh, uh, the classifying. I am import. Uh, I want you to know the naming, at least as we know them, and how we identify microorganisms and how we write the names and that sort of thing. The overall, the names for each of the classified, uh, just know that they exist and what the, the topics are. But I'm not going to have you uh, recapitulate uh, all the classification. Species and genera are the only two that we really worry about, and we'll talk about that. 
and we have to italicize and capitalize the first the species and then the gender use lower, lowercase and that sort of thing. So we'll talk about all that in the next section. And that'll be 1.4. And that concludes chapter 1. And thank you for hanging in there. And I'll have the uh, next uh, video here shortly. And um, I'll see you at that point in time. And take care.